He's about 455 yards away. He's going to hit about a two iron, I think. This is the School of Motion podcast. Come for the MoGraph, stay for the puns. So the creative director went to my site, was like, oh, hey, that's the guy that did this this stuff, went to my bio, saw that I wanted to work with them. And then he was like, well, we're looking for someone. So out of the blue, I got this email saying, hey, we really like what you're doing. Any interest in working with us? Signed, capacity. And I just went, fuck me. I was shocked. It was like an out-of-body experience. Like I could not believe that I got that email. Cinema 4D. How did it make you feel when I said that? Did you get a little excited? Did you get a little nervous? See, there's something about really cool technical 3D work that gets motion designers excited. Our guest today is a legitimate wizard with Cinema 4D, and he's also one half of the directing duo that call themselves Ranger and Fox. Brett Morris has had a pretty crazy career that led him from Sydney, Australia to Los Angeles. He did some time over at the incredible studio Capacity, and now he's forging ahead with his new company and doing some insane work for clients like Microsoft, PauseFest, and even Maxon. In this interview, we get into the weeds about how Brett developed his formidable 3D skills, how he managed to pick up such a great eye for design, and how he and his partner are structuring Ranger and Fox, which doesn't really follow the typical studio model. If you're a 3D geek, you will love this episode, and you'll also love Cinema 4D Basecamp, which will be ready in early 2018 and will be our first bootcamp style Cinema 4D course. We'll be talking about this one quite a bit in the future, so stay tuned. And now, here's Brett. Brett Morris, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, man. I'm a big fan of Ranger and Fox, and I can't wait to pick your brain. Hey, thanks for having me, Joey. I'm really excited to be here, too. Excellent. So, you know, for those listening who haven't yet heard about Ranger and Fox, because you guys are relatively new, um, but, I mean, you, your work is it, – it's it's a lot better than most companies uh, that are at your stage, but um, can you tell people a little bit about your background, about Ranger and Fox, and what your role is there? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, thanks to thanks to the kind words. Uh, yeah, we do kind of feel like the new kids on the block at the moment. Uh, we've we've been in operation since March of this year, and uh, it is it's a small company. It's Steve Panacara and myself, and we came from a studio called Capacity. And just through the natural evolution of an artist's career, we we decided to partner up and and do something for ourselves. And uh, prior to that. Uh, we were both at the company for you know five to seven years each. I'm obviously Australian, if you can't tell from the accent. And right. uh, <laughs> you don't say. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I, I had had maybe half a decade, give or take, of experience before coming out to the states, and that had kind of primed me to uh, be able to, I guess, feel comfortable at a, at a studio like Capacity because we can go into the the details as as to how I got there uh, later on, but. Um, I kind of came from like a jack of all trades background um, in broadcast and film. So it's it's been a, a pretty interesting career to get to this point. But uh, Ranger and Fox is, is certainly something that Steve and I are really proud of. And we feel like every moment in our life, in our career up until this point was the first baby step. And there's there's many more to go from here. Definitely. Do you mind if I ask how old you are? I am turning 32 next week. Okay, cool. So I'm 36. So we're we're close, close ish in age. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're the young guys in the industry. Yeah. This. So what I was what I was gonna what what you made me think of is that a lot of artists that are in their 30s right now came into this industry. The way I look at it is like the direct route to a motion design job is to, you know, learn design, get a, an, an education in design and, and animation, or even go to one of these like motion design schools. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you're kind of perfectly suited to do this stuff. But, you know, 15 years ago, that wasn't an option, you know, even 10 years ago, it wasn't really an option. So, a lot of people came in as a jack of all trades. And so I looked, I did my Google stocking of you before we chatted, mm -hmm. and I saw that you studied digital film. That, that was the only education I could find for you, um, which digital film to me, I'm assuming means 
production and shooting and maybe some editing. I'm assuming it doesn't mean technical 3D and design and compositing. So can you talk a little bit about that, your, your education background uh, and what you learned there? Yeah, I, yeah. Holistically, that's that's the nail on the head. I came out of school in 2002. And at the time, I knew I wanted to be uh, part of the film industry. Uh, my, my uncle is a film producer and works in television as well. So I had some experience and some insight into that world. And leaving school, I, I, I wanted to learn how to become an editor. But at the time in Australia, there wasn't really a like entry point uh, educational path for someone wanting to go into that into that world. But there were a couple of uh, small private colleges that were offering kind of sort of like a holistic uh, approach to production. And I, I went to a college called JMC. And at the time, the college had been around for a uh, you know, couple of decades, but it was mostly focused on music and uh, audio recording and business management. And they opened up this new sector, which was the production side of things. So we kind of came in there. Um, it might have only been a couple of years into its, into its program. It was all very new. And that whole experience was pretty much like you said, it was, it was learning production. It was being on set. It was understanding the post-production process. I mean, even backing up a couple of steps before that pre-production or the legal work, copywriting, we kind of walked away from that, uh, sort of course feeling well primed to become a runner (laughs) or like a a production (laughs) assistant. But, uh, you know, it, it was a really, really cool experience. And, uh, I think, I think everyone at that time in that era really had basically, you know, the pick of the litter of type of work to get into because there wasn't any like defined paths to go into after that, after that point in uh, the education. So I, I, unlike some of my, uh, college uh, buddies ended up going to work for a small production company. Some of them ended up going to work for a big broadcaster and they kind of went the route of becoming promo producers and now creative directors in the promo world. Um, I went to my uncle's company, which was a small production company. It was, it was basically him, uh, a production manager slash producer. And then he would just scale up whenever he needed to. And he would take on different types of jobs from, live event broadcasting of, you know, many screens upwards of, you know, a hundred plus different types of screens across the stage. Uh, he'd do, uh, coding for game shows. So if there was a show like one versus a hundred, he'd actually write the code and integrate it into the hardware for all of the contestants, uh, answering the, the, the scores, all that sort of stuff. And then he was also a film producer and writer and was getting a film in development at the time. So, I kind of had my real education with him after school. And I mean real as in the hands-on part of it, because I think uh, even in those early days when we were at JMC, it was, it was great. Like it was, it was all theoretical and practical, but I think when you're on a job, you, you get to see uh, the, the, the titled people behave the way they do. And you understand that hierarchy and, and you definitely kind of know your place in, in a large scale production. But uh, that, that was a really cool experience for, you know, a young 19 to, I don't know, probably 24-year-old uh, guy just kind of learning the ropes. Yeah, you and I have a very similar uh, history. I, I did almost the exact same thing because I, I studied film and television, mm-hmm. which was, you know, production and yep. mostly production with a little bit of editing. And then I worked at a small production company that had one Final Cut Pro editing bay, and I was the assistant editor. Right, right. Um, So it was, you know, I was there probably a couple of years, and then I saw, it was either Ultra Love Ninja, it was some MK12 thing. That was my gateway drug. Of course, of course. Into this industry. So I'm, w- I'm wondering if you, like, what was it that pulled you away from that into the the world that you're in now? Yeah, so I think After Effects was always on the fringe. It was always part of the conversation on any sort of production that we were doing. We were doing a lot of final cut editing. And so after effects was this sort of extension that could do titles or effects and, and, and sort of, you know, make the production value higher. And I, I really didn't, I, I wasn't taught after effects. No one sort of held my hand in the early days of college. It wasn't really something at college that we were taught. Um, they had a computer animation course and we integrated with them at some point just to kind of get some crossover uh, information shared. 
And that was the first time I saw it. I thought, oh, that's really cool. I didn't realize you could do this layering thing. I didn't really know about keyframes, but hey, when we went into production with my uncle, I remember at some point he kind of said to me like, hey, I use After Effects, but if you learn After Effects, I can give you more work. And so in that process, I started to read manuals and books, any book that was available. I mean, the Brian Maffitt uh, tapes were, were floating around at that stage. Yeah, I, legend. Yeah, and I just I just absorbed it. And I, th- I, think, I think at the time, the internet wasn't, it, it just wasn't what it is today. And uh, having access to other people's workflows uh, through, you know, tutorials or, or presentations just wasn't a thing. So it was a lot of reading on the forums. It was, you know, di- digesting all these VHS tapes. And it wasn't until I think Motionographer kind of started up that there was this exchange of projects, you know, studios putting out their latest and greatest. And I think you know, whether it was MK12 or uh, Syndrome, Syndrome were one of my early inspiration uh, studios that I really admired, that I started to see this design being created in After Effects. And that kind of just piqued my interest. And I, and I wanted to kind of learn how they did that because at the time it was all closed doors. You know, people weren't sharing their uh, production techniques and they weren't, they weren't right. giving breakdowns or anything like that. So yeah, I, I think that kind of really got me excited about the potential of, of what After Effects could do. I think that's that's kind of the gateway drug for a lot of people. That it's That's one of the, my favorite things about our industry is that like almost every day I see something that I don't know how it was right, done. Right. Like I have an idea and, 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 and your work has a lot of that quality to it where, you know, I'm sure like once you explain it, Oh, that's clever. But it's, it's like, it's like a magic. Right, right. Um, and, and you're totally right. Cause I remember being on mograph.net and I mean, there were some heavy hitters on there, but, but it was still kind of like the wild west. Right. Like, how the heck did you get, you know, the type to look 3D and all that kind oh, of stuff? Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah. So, so the technical side always drew me in. And then from there, I went into the design and the animation side, that w- which I feel is backwards, but that's how it worked for me. Um, now, your work, Ranger and Fox's work, um, and, I, I, and I want, I'm really curious. I want to get into, like, the division of labor over there. But it's super, super technical, a lot of it. Particles and, you know, photorealistic renders and sculpts and all this crazy stuff. Um, has that always kind of been your thing? You know, some people are good at, like, the simple – illustrated, well animated stuff. And then other people don't want to do that at all. They want X particles and octane. Right. And that. Is that was that kind of what sucked you in? Yeah, I think so. I mean, even to to what you were saying just now about that like magic trick. I I was always into Cinefax and really obsessed with VFX. And I always found that VFX was like the pinnacle of craftsmanship because they were integrating physical effects with, you know, or practical effects that were recorded on set with CGI. And I just, that, that whole process blew blew my mind. So from a very early age, I was always interested in the computer science aspect of what design was. I think I was, I was more interested in reading a VFX article than I would be reading a design branding article. If that sort of puts my, my, my focus into context. And I think uh, just over the, the years, I've always gravitated towards, hey, what's, what's the latest and greatest coming out of Seagraph? Like who's doing the most interesting things with, you know, these, these software platforms that I use that are kind of catering it for design or animation. And I've always had an interest in following the sort of new frontier uh, of, of computer animation. And with Ranger and Fox, just, just to speak on the division of labor, Steve and I have a, a pretty, pretty good sort of yin and yang skill set. So while I might be kind of the considered like the 3D guy and Steve's the 2D guy, there's a lot of crossover. And um, where I think we find this sweet spot is we come together on conceptualizing and working through the issues and, and trying to have a narrative and, and everything always have to have has some sort of intention behind it. So we really come together as equals on um, the concepting side. And then from there, it's just iterating uh, on the 3D, doing the R&D. That always comes into Steve's hands and, you know, we'll go through the, the more compositing, um, 2Ds, animation, editing side of things. And the exchange of work is very fluid. And there's definitely a lot of crossover, but Steve's a tremendously talented typographer 
and his sensibilities to rhythm and animation, whether it's seen in type animation or editing, uh, I think is you know world class. So I think the combination of the two of us is is a pretty fun duo to 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 work within. So every piece of work that we put out, every project that we work on, we always want to um, stand behind it as being something that we're really proud of. So we we tend to invest a lot of ourselves into the projects. Is Stephen? more the design lead or do you guys sort of split design duties? I'd say we split them. Okay. Yeah, I think um, each of us brings a certain perspective to design. Um, there's there's certainly projects where a lot of it will be on Steve's plate and I'll sort of play support with whatever, you know, asset generation. And then there'll be other ones where it might be more 3D and, and that's sort of on my plate where Steve will support me with 2D uh, elements. So it, it does swing a little bit, but generally it's it's it's... 50 50. So you didn't go to school for design. And um, if your, you know, uh, digital film program was anything like my film and TV program, there was no design mentioned. Correct. <laughs> so, yeah. So, but, but when I, when I look at Ranger and Fox's work and, and, you know, some of the stuff you worked on at capacity, there's a clear sense of design and, and, and rules being followed and good color theory and things like that. So for you, where did that come from? Like, how did you develop that? I'd say when I got to Foxtel. So if you're breaking down like my, my timeline, the first couple of years was school. The next few three to four years was at interactive originals with my uncle. And the next three years, three and a half years, I was at Foxtel. While I was at interactive originals, it was, it was a slew of projects. There was no real consistency to the type of work that we were doing. It was a bit of everything. Uh, which was great because it just kind of exposed me to just a wider gamut of of work that was available and 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 interesting stuff that that had to be solved. So when I got to Foxtel, it was focusing strictly on broadcast design, and I got that job through John Dickinson of MotionWorks. Oh, great dude! Yeah, uh, I mean, but yeah. back in the day, I, like making it look great was also another DVD tutorial series that I'd purchased and I always admired John and, and obviously he was a big role model and influence prior to even meeting him just because of who he was in the industry. And uh, when he tweet, tweeted out that Foxtel were looking for designers, I thought, well, I know After Effects, I'll give it a go. Landed in there and really started to focus on design. And that environment was really interesting for me because I, f I feel like that was like the next stage of my education because we were given any type of job from any type of internal team, uh, internal channel there. And just for context, Foxtel is kind of like a direct TV. It's a, it's a big giant cable company in Australia. And, uh, we, we would work for some of the, the boxing pay-per-view events. We'd do stuff for film trailers that were going on the movie on demand channel. There was stuff that was going out for UK TV with their branding. And uh, I think that being in that environment, just having to think quickly on your feet, abide by branding guidelines, come up with concepts for campaigns. I think that's kind of where I really like sharpen my teeth in the design sense. And I think me just, you know, I think a lot of people have the imposter syndrome and I, you know, I, I would say that I have the biggest imposter syndrome as, as anyone would say, but uh, I, I would always feel like I needed to step up to be able to, 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 be able to compete with the other guys in the team because they were really talented designers in that team. And I would take any design theory book home and just devour it. And um, I think over a couple of years started to feel really comfortable in the world of design. Were they splitting the design and the animation up amongst the team or were you actually expected to do both? Uh, both. So I think, I think in Australia as, as a whole, everyone is a bit of a general generalist. I think it doesn't matter if you're in a design studio or a production studio, you kind of have to wear a couple of hats. And that team in Foxtel, it was, it was a really small team. They had the print team and then the design team or, you know, animation team. And the print guys really just didn't touch After Effects or any animation at all. And they didn't, they didn't really cross over to any of the design work uh, that we were doing. It was kind of like a production side and a, and a print side. And in the production side, it was basically JD, myself, and probably four other people. And there might have been five projects and one project per person, and maybe there was another one, there'd be two. So we we're expected to work all stages of the project. And that's just kind of how it worked out in that studio. And I, I, I'm thankful for that because I think uh, every sort of uh, step in my career, I've always been thrown in the deep end and it's sink or swim and it's just 
just do whatever you can do to keep up. And then once you feel comfortable, then, you know, great. We can, we can have a breather and, and, and chill out for a second. I think that's the best scenario you can find yourself in, to be honest, because, you know, the, I feel like the old model or, or like, I don't know, it still exists in a lot of places, but the old model of specializing, you've got the design team and then you've got the sort of animation production team. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been exposed to that quite a bit and it works. It's great, but it only works at scale. Right. Um, and now I'm sure you're thankful for that experience being, you know, one half of Ranger and Fox, because having that generalist, uh, skill set and that mentality, I'm sure, lets you keep your overhead a lot lower than if you needed to have five people just to be able to execute at the level you guys execute at, right? Oh, 100. percent Yeah, that's that's a that's a conversation that Steve and I are always having. I mean, between the two of us, uh, while we're at capacity, there were many projects that we either just did ourselves completely, or you know, between the two of us, would would do in its entirety. So. I think capacity also had that generalist sort of uh, philosophy with the artist, but on just a bigger scale. And so I think now that we're in our own, own sort of shop and, and trying to figure out our own design philosophies and, and how we want to run a project, we don't really look at any part of the process of saying, hey, there's a big variable of X in that type of job. We need to fill X. We we feel pretty comfortable across the whole spectrum of a, of a project. but. When we do scale, I think we will target those specialists and I think we will target sort of director level specialists just because uh, of the sort of caliber that someone can bring in as a specialist weight. So right. that's just something that, you know, we haven't fully explored, but it, it is something that we're we're always talking about. Well, let's talk a little bit about sort of the technical end of what you specifically do and, and are really good at. Um, and, and it's interesting that you, you mentioned the caliber of work that a specialist can bring in. Cause when I think of that, I think of, you know, if I, if I have some job come in and it has a fluid simulation, I don't want to do that. I want someone who's, who knows how to do that. Or if it's some really elaborate particle setup, but a lot of what you're doing is very technical and almost, it's like, you're kind of blurring the line between generalist and specialist. So let's just dig into to some of this stuff. Uh, I've watched a few of your um, presentations you've done for Maxon at SIGGRAPH. Um, we're going to link to those in the show cool. notes. So everyone, you can go watch. Brett is a great presenter and the presentations are so cool. Um, so how did you develop these super technical skills in 3D across all these different disciplines? I, <laughs> yeah, good question. I, I, I think that's, that's a, little bit of everything. Uh, I, I'll back up and, and put some context around it. Uh, John Dickinson and I created a product called movie type like a hundred years ago. And that was really something that forced me to think about espresso and, uh, user experience. So in a very early stage of my career, uh, I was already tinkering with Espresso to control tools and build tools that had a had a mass consumption sort of um, end output. So it wasn't like I was just tinkering with, oh, a little particle setup. I was trying to build a robust tool that could do multiple different things in multiple different scenarios and be super easy and fluid to use to someone that doesn't necessarily – or who's not interested in understanding how it works, who can just pick it up and with a couple of sliders do something uh, terrific. So I had, I had that sort of embedded in me in a really early stage of my career. And with that, I've always just had a natural curiosity as to how certain effects were achieved in other projects and, and what VFX was doing. And, and just always, like I said, always just kind of processing like what was going on in the computer sciences. And with cinema, I've, I've always felt that Espresso has always been one of these like dark art secrets that may, right. maybe, maybe like this guy over there knows how to do it, but Hey, like, you know, you want to be careful because you don't want to go down that Espresso route. It's pretty complicated stuff. <laughs> I've, I've always kind of like embraced that. And I, I always found that it's such a powerful thing to work with. And I don't know, man, I just get really obsessive about it. I, I find that uh, a challenge, uh, whether it be a, a design or a technical challenge within Espresso, is just critical thinking um, to solve creative challenges. 
And I've always just loved that part of the process. So whether it be at capacity, for example, like I was just thinking one of the NFL total access jobs, we had a large team that was at scale, at full scale for the, the studio of varying degrees of experience. We needed to be able to like feed them some pretty complicated pipeline tools that they didn't need to kind of necessarily worry about. So going through that challenge of looking at a project in the sense of like, how can I build tools to give to a st- to give to an artist that, you know, they don't need to get a headache trying to digest or trying to figure out like that part of the process. I love that. And that's probably my favorite part of the, all of the processes that, that come with motion design. And I think just over the years, baby steps going from one, one challenge to another and trying to challenge myself even more and learn more about the other nodes and trying to comprise them together. I think that just kind of opens up a more of an insight as to how to work with particles and hey when you start to think about vector math it all makes sense because you've been processing it so I think it it's it's something that kind of feeds itself as time goes on as well yeah I I think you you did a really good job of describing the joy like okay so there are some motion designers I'm definitely like that I could sit there and write after effects expressions and spend 12 hours building this thing that I could have just hand animated in like 10 <laughs> minutes if I, but yeah, it's so satisfying. Right. I want to say just, just for, just for anyone listening who doesn't know what Expresso is. Uh, so inside cinema 4d, there's a lot of different ways to automate things and Expresso though. And Brett, you, maybe you could take a crack at explaining it to you. The way I would describe it is it lets you essentially do the same thing as, as expressions or coding in After Effects. You can automate things. You can create a control that when you, that, you know, 10 things react to it in different ways, but it's, it's a node based kind of visual system. Yeah. Um, And it is super deep. It's incredibly deep. Do you think, you know, so Cinema 4D, I used to use it every day when I was, uh, when I was creative director and an animator, but I never, I never got the opportunity to work with lots of Cinema 4D artists. Um, I've worked with a few, and I've, I know a bunch. But in your opinion, do you think that there are different breeds of Cinema 4D artists or even motion designers in general? Like, are there Cinema 4D artists that want no part of that? They want to make keyframes and model things and light it and make it beautiful. They don't want to touch any of that. And then there's there's guys like you that, you know, you can go all day into Espresso, and I'm sure you've gone even deeper. I'm sure you've dabbled in like Python or coffee and that that stuff too. Like, do you think that there's a split like that? Or do you think you kind of need to have both ends to really be effective? Oh, uh, to be effective? No, you can be anything. I, 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 I believe there are certain types of artists, 100% agree with you there. But I think of the gamut, of types of artists cinema is a very accessible tool that it doesn't it doesn't really need to have that technical sort of insight to get it to sing as i would say so right so i i think there's definitely pros and cons of having each each approach you know each end of the spectrum but i think i mean i'm obviously biased because i enjoy that side of it but i do think there's a lot of benefits to having an insight into espresso because Conceptually speaking, I mean, you are essentially making a cinema 4D into, you know, you're like a marionette, you're a puppet master, you're making it do what you want it to do. You're not necessarily like hammering in keyframes to, to manually do things. You're creating systems. So you pull one lever and it does a complicated task that, you know, allows you to think about creative uh, challenge as opposed to, you know, like, how do I, you know, animate X to Y or, you know, it's, it kind of takes away this element of thought processing when you automate systems. So yeah, I would definitely say that there's, there's benefits to each, but I think anyone can be effective in it. I think cinema has been de- designed in a way that allows anyone to open it up and be effective. I've, I've certainly worked with each type of artist and I'd say like, even, even if I compare myself to Steve, like Steve and I are both very different artists when it comes to working in cinema, Steve is very like design focused. And so he uses cinema in a particular way. And I am the guy that jumps in and goes, Oh no, you shouldn't do that. Do, do this. Hey, let me build this for you. And, and Hey, can I clean this up for you? And what about this? But that's just because I like doing things in that manner. Whereas Steve can create amazingly beautiful frames and he's a great lighter and uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with the way he works. It's just, we come at it from different angles and I'm always trying to like impose a little bit of myself on him and say, Hey, 
maybe you can uh, do a little bit of espresso here. And actually, uh, we've just started, I mean, we've had Redshift in the studio for a while, but Steve's like finally getting into it and he <laughs> has to understand espresso if, if he's using Redshift. So that's that's something that I've, I've really enjoyed talking to him about because as I explain it and, um, you know, turn these like complicated ideas into like really simple sort of metaphors it's i can see like he's like oh cool yeah yeah, yeah. i get it i get it I get it and so he's getting really energized about what its capabilities are within the redshift espresso but you know i'll i'll obviously you know keep pushing the espresso thing on him for for the lifetime ahead of us <laughs> yeah it, it is totally intoxicating once you grasp the the power of it and how much time it can save you um and just for people listening redshift is kind of the hot new gpu renderer um that's kind of it seems like it's kind of competing with octane a little bit um and i know a lot of a lot of people have been, you know, telling us about it and how great it is. One of our teaching assistants, uh, Liam Cleesham, he's been making tutorials about Redshift and he's obsessed with it. Um, so let's talk about, um, you know, the, the Cinema 4D ecosystem is, is really cool to me, especially if you compare it to, say, the Maya uh, ecosystem of artists, right? Like if you go into visual effects uh, or you go into Pixar, like character animation world, people do tend to specialize and you have modelers and you have riggers and, and texture artists and stuff like that. But Cinema 4D for, for a really long time, just it seemed like there weren't enough Cinema 4D artists to justify that. And the, the app seems to be designed to encourage people to be generalists. So do you think that the ecosystem of, of the C4D world, is it broad enough that people can start specializing now. Like you could just be the espresso guy that gets called in like the, the fixer who comes in, or you could just model, or do you recommend that people who want to use C4D still take this generalist approach? Yeah. Good question. I think, yeah, it's a tricky one to answer because I think everyone, uh, everyone that uses cinema has a different entry point. I think certainly as an industry, there is room for specialists, hundred percent. There, there's definitely people that I know that are terrific modelers in cinema. There, there's character animators that are just really good uh, at character animating in cinema. I think, I think the industry will certainly take in more specialists as as time goes on, and especially if things start to go in this sort of like smaller sh- studio route, like Ranger and Fox is going we are going to look outwards for those specialists that fit our pipeline. So I can definitely see like over the next couple of years, that's going to be more important to be a specialist. But on the flip side, a generalist is a generalist. Like, I mean, if you can throw anyone into any part of the pipeline or the the project, I mean, that's an amazing skill to have. I mean, and yeah, I I don't know. It's a a big question to ask, but I I think um, generally the ecosystem for uh, cinema has been based around design and motion design. So the skills that generally people take on are of cameras, types, uh, just animation in general, lighting. The character animation stuff hasn't been a big push in the past because you're right, like Maya pretty much absorbed them or you know Pixar absorbed those ones. So I always think that we're at like a tipping point with a lot of po- uh, these sorts of ideas in the industry, um, but it's it's always con- constantly changing that I don't really have like a, 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 like a, right. a concrete answer uh, other than it's it kind of works both ways. Yeah, I agree with you. I think we are kind of at a, a tipping point. And I, my, my theory, it'll be interesting to see how this pans out, is that there's going to be more and more generalists yeah. and less and less people specializing. I think... You know, in Los Angeles, where you've just got this enormous, cool scene of of motion design and visual effects studios and production, stuff like that, I think you can support specialists there. But, you know, I live in Florida. Like, if someone's a really good C4D particles expert, you know, unless they can really sell themselves all over the world, it's it's tough to just do that. So let's talk about what makes someone hireable, right? So, uh, you know, you're, you guys are growing uh, and and you actually said, I wrote it down. You said the words, when we do scale, it wasn't, if we decide to scale, it was when we do scale. Uh Um, so everybody sends your reels. (laughs) So, so if you need to hire a cinema 4d artist to execute a job, 
what are you looking for? Like, what are things that, that you hope they can do? And, and are, are there any things that you don't want them to do that bad habits, stuff like that? Oh, for sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> b- bad, bad habits will definitely be something that, um, will raise an eyebrow, but that's, that's just me being particular. I would say, look, I, I think it all comes down to attitude. I've, I've met some younger guys and girls over the years that I would say on a objectively, uh, like I would say objectively, the work is still in its, you know, infancy, infancy, they're still growing and they're still figuring a lot of stuff out, but their attitude is spot on. You know, they, they have a willingness to learn and a willingness to fail. And I think that speaks volumes to me. I, I would much prefer to work with that type of person than the person with a little bit of a, a an adjust a, 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 like an attitude adjustment that they need to make. So I'd say it's it's about the personal connection first and foremost, and then from there, based on the skill set, I would make a path for them into the project that I feel like would be a challenge without sort of numbing them to the process. I would I would I would right. make sure that they they felt like their place was, um, um, you know, something that was that was. Uh, of, of importance to the project. So I think it's, it's about trying to fit the right person to the right project and the right attitude. It's, it's really interesting. Everybody, that's basically what everybody says when I ask them a question like this. And we've done, we've done surveys and, you know, I think when you're new to the industry, it might seem sort of like a meritocracy, like as long as your work's good enough, yeah. you'll get booked over someone whose work isn't as good. Yeah. And in truth, it doesn't work that way at all. Yeah, 100%, man. <laughs> yeah, which I think it, which, which I think is a good thing. Um, I'm curious because you seem to have an opinion. What, what are some bad habits that you think people have in Cinema Fritty or, or things that, you, you know, just common mistakes that, that you wish would go away? Uh, okay, so, so my, my biggest things are like scene optimization. I'd say that uh, ah. if, if there's a large scale scene that's being passed around between multiple artists and everyone needs to kind of – jump in, jump out and, and do their thing. If the scene optimization and layout isn't great, you know, the exchange of data, the exchange of information, I think is one of my pet peeves. So when someone comes into a, a project and, and doesn't use instances correctly, or if the shaders are just, you know, it's the wild west of, of how they're working with shaders, little, little things like that um, add up quickly in a, in a big production. And so that's something that I'm always trying to police uh, for the right reasons to make sure that, you know, the, the pipeline is clean and uh, the exchange of data is, is efficient. That's, that's, that's really where, where I, I like to kind of put my imprint on the project. And that's not to say that like those things should be known. A lot of that stuff is learned over time. And so um, in the past, I've always tried to work with people and, and trying to explain like why setting an instance to a render instance is better in this particular case or why, you know, why we shouldn't use sub subdivision services inside of a cloner or why we should use a connect here. It's those sorts of things, which are, which are more on like the, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just strictly optimizing that, 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 that is a big thing for me. Yeah. Well, that's a really good one. And I think that's one of those things too, where the simplicity of cinema is a blessing and a curse because you know, if, if it's just you and you're learning it, you can make a lot of quote mistakes sure. and get these amazing results and it looks fantastic. And you have no idea that what you're doing is, you know, multiplying your polygon count times 10 for no reason. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and that's, and, and so there's kind of, I kind of split cinema 4d, like I've taught it before and, and I tried to split it into there's cinema 4D skills, but then there's this general 3D knowledge theory that you kind of have to have or that you should have, I think. Things like understanding, you know, polygons and edges and points and subdivision and, and things like that. Did you just pick that stuff up kind of through osmosis throughout your career? Have you ever, you know, did you learn any of that in school? Yeah, I think it's just something that I've learned over time. I've, I've picked up many just computer science books and uh, especially ones that are about 3D renderers and how a 3D program just fundamentally works. And I think all of that has kind of just added to the, the, the language over the years and how I sort of approach the work. I, I do see the blessing and the curse of the way that cinema is designed. And I think what they've done is, is 
the right way to bring people into 3D because if our only option was something like Houdini, I don't think the 3D industry would be as big as it is. Um, I think Houdini is just insanely powerful and I've got a tremendous amount of respect for it. But I've, I've sat there for months on end and tried to just absorb it. And I think just with my general curiosity, I have to kind of know everything about it. And with right. Houdini, you really need to know everything about it to be effective with it. And cinema, you don't need to know much at all to be effective with it as far as like the 3D foundation sort of knowledge. So I think cinema have, have oh, Maxon have done a terrific job of, of kind of introducing a whole wave of designers and animators and modelers into the 3D world without letting them peek under the hood and not let them worry about what a vertex is or for any vector math or anything like that. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a, uh, a, a thing that I've, I've, I've really enjoyed learning over, over the time, but it's, it's all been just on my own, own time picking up all that stuff. Yeah. And, and I'll reiterate what you said about Maxon too. I mean, they've clearly changed the industry with cinema 4d and, and, and I, I think that, you know, the, the, it's not, it's not even like a downside, you know, it's just a reality that when you abstract things, you know, in software to make it easy for the user, uh, then in a production setting where you have 10 cinema 4d artists sharing assets, one of them may have done something that's going to slow things down, but, um, you know, but that you, I think you're right. That comes with time, and and uh, hopefully uh, we, we're actually putting together a Cinema 4D course now, and we're going to hopefully address some of that stuff. Try and get some oh, of those cool. bad That's habits great. out before you before you get too far up. So let's talk about. Um, so let's let's now progress through your career. So before starting Ranger and Fox, you worked at Capacity, and I, I used to teach a uh, an animation class. And uh, at, a, at a school here in Florida called Ringling, and one of the assignments was to do a uh, an on air graphics package for a network. And so I was tr- I would try to find like good examples, and I think half of them came from Capacity. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's one of my, it's one of my favorite shops. Um, so how how did you end up getting hired there, and what was your role there? Oh yeah, um, well yeah, it's funny you say that because back in Australia when I was uh, you know a young kid just looking you know, from the outside into the motion industry, which is, you know, LA and London and New York, uh, capacity always stood out as, as one of the most impressive studios. I think, like you say, with, with the references in your, in your, uh, in your class, I was also referencing probably one of their projects in every project I was doing at some point. So I took a special interest in the in the company as I was growing up, and um, it wasn't until I, I did some branding stuff for Foxtel that had a little bit of success going around the web. I mean, it went on my Vimeo page, and of of all the projects that I put up, it had you know the most views, and they, it happened to get in front of the creative director over there, and I don't think anything came of it the first time around, but. Uh, one of the other guys that worked there, Billy Cummins at the time, he was like an ex uh, the onion and ESPN designer. And I really liked his work. I thought he was really, really cool. Like he was doing some of the really cool, uh, like sports center graphics back in the day where it was like oh, super, cool. super meaty 3d stuff. And I naively wrote him a message on his website thinking that it was a private message, but it was actually a public comment. So it was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like a really shitty like WordPress website that he had. And so it was yeah. like, hey, Billy, love what you're doing. Really good stuff. You know, cheers, Brett. So somehow someone at Capacity saw that comment on Billy's site, went to my site through the link and noticed that I had done these uh, this, this branding piece that um, they had seen. And coincidentally, I had just updated my website and part of my bio actually said the very last line, which I was encouraged to write by my my partner, she said like, you know, you should, you should say like what your goals are in your bio. So the very last line was Brett saying goal is to work with, uh, design studios around the world, such as capacity and named a couple others. So the creative director kind of went to my site was like, Oh, Hey, that's the guy that did this, this stuff went to my bio, saw that I wanted to work with them. And then he was like, well, we're looking for someone. So out of the blue, I got this email saying, Hey, we really like what you're doing. Any interest in working with us? signed capacity and i just went fuck me wow what (laughs) one of my friends is taking the piss right now like i was i was shocked like i was 
I was like, it was like an out of body experience. Like I could not believe that I got that email and sure enough, you know, following through with, you know, more communications and Skype and everything, it, it was legit. And they were prepared to sponsor me. And, uh, I left, I resigned from Foxtel and worked from Sydney with capacity for a few months until the, the visa stuff got signed over. And then I made the transition to LA full time and, in a, yeah, that's that's basically how it went down. And you know, for for the longest time, you know, the, at least the first year or so, I was just driving to work from Venice, where I was living at the time, and driving to capacity to work. And it was just, you know, it was just such a surreal thing that this goal of mine, that one was to work on like a global platform, you know, a company that was doing um, really high profile stuff, to live in America specifically in LA and then three working for a, a studio that I had such respectful like capacity. So it was, it was the dream come true. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was much, very much enjoyed. What an incredible story, man. <laughs> that's, that's, that's amazing. So, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out like, what's the takeaway here for everyone listening. I mean, I think you did, you did a lot of things that probably seemed like an accident and it just happened to work yeah. out, but they're actually things people say to do. Like you reached out to people you admire. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is that you wrote down your goal, which it seems like, it, you know, one of these new agey things like, oh, write down your goal. And if you want it bad enough, it'll mm -hmm. happen. You know, and I, I don't think it works that way, but <laughs> writing it down, <laughs> like it clearly influenced, you know, the series of events that man, that might be the best, uh, you know, origin story of anyone in this industry I've ever heard. That's really good. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so on your LinkedIn page, it said that your title there was technical director. So, what does that mean at a place like Capacity? Uh, yeah, uh, I was there for all in up like five years, and I think after the first two or three years, I was definitely in a position where I I felt like I was pushing the pipeline and you know trying to in influence and integrate other packages into the into the studio and try to do larger scale uh you know overcome larger scale technical challenges and so we had the discussion of like okay i i want to be defined um with a different title whether it be head of 3d or a cg lead or technical director and so technical director was was given just because one of the other creative directors had previously been called being called a technical director. So at the time it was um, mostly looking at pushing some of those ideas into the studio. And when a large scale project came in, that was really when that role had the spotlight on it because there would be a lot of moving parts, you know, taking design iterations that are, you know, mid approval, trying to figure out how, how these are going to be seeing themselves all the way through the pipeline. So looking after the render pipeline, the compositing pipeline, looking at any After Effects scripting and expressions that can automate certain things as well as, you know, after, uh, sorry, cinema with Expresso or Python, whatever it was. So it was basically having that like 30 foot view over a project and making sure that whether it be a new shot or a new sequence or a new deliverable, there were certain tools that had been developed that could get the project from you know this the starting line to the finishing line as quickly as possible without any friction so it, it was a bit of everything but it, it really was um pipeline management you know and i think larger 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 studios a technical director i believe is someone that is doing a lot of scripting that is building proprietary proprietary software to automate you know just huge scale uh hardware and software automation with you know hundreds or thousands of artists between countries you know like the, there's there's real work that goes into into that title right but i think for a design studio it it can be a little bit of a generalist in that technical role so i i would play i'd play yeah many different roles whether it be you know if there was simulations particle work that would always come through my plate if there was any r d for a new renderer that would always go through me if it was hey we need to kind of scale our hardware and try and figure out what the render pipeline looks like going forward it was it was kind of a lot of those sorts of challenges that i i had to figure out and i really love that role like i mean to me it was always something like um you know i'd, I'd play with my 
left side of the brain for a couple of months and then I'd go to my right brain for another month and, and, and do a, like a creative project. So it was kind of like a good balance as well. What was the pipeline there? At the time, it was cinema, After Effects, pretty standard. And then we integrated okay. Octane about, uh, I mean, well, we, we integrated Octane when they first were able to render animation. So that was probably like version one point something. And uh, we scaled out a whole new GPU farm. Uh, we, we had turbulence, we had X particles, we had all those tools. We tinkered with Houdini a little bit, but it wasn't something that we relied on and used sparingly. And, you know, all the designers obviously used Photoshop and Illustrator. So it was, it was pretty standardized tools, but I think the creative challenges that we had were at scale or like full, full capacity for the studio. And so it was just trying to alleviate pressure and, and try and figure out ways that we could kind of optimize the, the process in any which way possible. Yeah, that does sound like kind of the perfect fit for you, you know, being, being sort of the, the guy that loves to figure things out and, and solve problems. Were you designing and animating as well, or were you mostly yeah. sort of assisting in production? No, I was, I, like I'd say if, yeah, I'd say if most projects I'd have some level of design input. Um, some obviously were just handled uh, by other designers and I, I'd take over on the 3D side. I really enjoy designing. I think um, so. Uh, like any of the design frames that are on my site, they're ones that I've actually designed. So I'm pretty careful about not putting out other people's designs up on my site. But um, you know, concept, uh, concepting and, and trying to figure out sequencing and, and making sure that you know what you're creating to a brief is is a challenge that I find equally rewarding. It's just I probably do more of the technical stuff than the, the creative challenges. So I always, capacity always struck me as, you know, more than some other shops, like a design driven mm -hmm. shop. You know, the, I remember the NBC more colorful rebrand, which it's just so simple, but it's so mm -hmm. smart, like and brilliant. And we'll link to that. Uh, there's a case study on capacity site. Um, you know, so, so you must've been around some pretty heavy hitter design talent there. Uh, I'm curious what, sort of lessons you, you took away from being around that level of design? I think, I think it's kind of like you're able to witness something like incredible being created and you're able to talk about the process along the way. And everyone there has a pretty high standard of, of what um, good design is. And I think even when you hit that standard, you need to go further and so, uh, like, I, I just think it's, it's, a, it's a place that really thrives on doing the best work possible. And they're pretty selective about uh, the types of clients and types of projects that they work with because it is something that, you know, it's something special that they bring to the table and they want to be able to complement the brand. And so I think that's also something that attributes to really good design is that there's a, there's a good partnership between the client and the studio that they're able to make something really special. Um, whether it be the client trusting the studio or the, the client coming them and just really letting them run with, with, with ideas that are going to be, you know, something special that they can get behind. So it's, it's, it's definitely a combination of everything, but it's also personality. I mean, they cultivated a pretty, pretty fun culture there. You know, everyone, you know, there's not much ego in that studio. I think a lot of the people there are genuinely good friends and love hanging out with each other. So I think when you've got that support network around you and you're trying to do good design, I think it just generally breeds good work. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the shops that I've freelanced at and stuff like that, that have a strong design ethic, I think it, it's almost like the culture there elevates everybody's design yeah. shops, you know, and, and having just the right combination of competition and trying to show off for your buddy mm -hmm. across the room and, and stuff like that. What was, was there a, you know, was there like a design culture there that, you know, kind of you think people could plug in and instantly like their design would elevate because of the process and, and the culture, or were they just really picky about the talent that they hired too? Cause sometimes, you know, this is, it's like these days you can hire anybody from anywhere in the world freelance. So you can make yourself look like you have all these design shops when really you just hired a really good freelance right, right. designer, but capacity, capacity was so consistent that it was clear that they had figured out how to get good design consistently you know, with their staff. I'm just curious if, if you have any insight into, you know, the, 
was like the design process or design culture there? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I I would say of of my time being there, I didn't see too many people leave the company. So I think they're first and foremost, I think they look for people that have good design skills that think about their design being um, like a tangible problem to solve and they have complementary aesthetics. And then second to all that is the personality traits. So I think they have a pretty, a pretty strict requirements of, of the type of people that they hire, but evidently they've hired the right people over their period of time. Um, they, they wouldn't, work with freelancers unless they really, really needed to. And that was to keep that house style sort of pure. And uh, that was intentional the whole way through. And it was, it was something that I wasn't sure about at first, but then I could see it over the years that, you know, you, you keep the talent all under the one roof and they, they learn and grow. And, you know, inevitably, you know, people have moved on, but uh, when people do move on, the, the next person that's kind of behind them is, is ready to fill the shoes pretty quickly. So I think that's very intentional and they played the long, long game on that. That's really cool. Yeah. And I, it's, it's something that not a lot of, I haven't, I don't, I'm not sure I've ever heard anybody say that about a studio that they intentionally try not to use freelancers, not, you know, not cause they don't want to, but because they want, they want to maintain the style right. that they're known for. Um, and it's a very smart move. That's really interesting. So you mentioned that while you were there, you didn't see too many people leave. However, you left. <laughs> yep. uh, uh, so, so, um, what was it, you know, what was it just time you'd been there for many years? You want to leave? Like what, what was the thought process? Yeah. I just said, fuck it. I'm out. No. <laughs> yeah. Peace. <laughs> Flipped your desk over. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Um, yeah, you're cool. You're cool. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I was on a visa and that visa was a two year term. And after the second term, I had an extension on it. So I, I basically played out three, uh, five years total there. And uh, coming from Australia, I had uh, a different experience when it came to vacation time. You know, in Australia, we'd have four weeks off and um, a little bit more relaxed about that sort of stuff versus yep. America. So I, I always felt that that was a bit of a, a struggle for me. And I, you know, I was, I was sitting on the fence whether or not I should renew my visa for another term or maybe try my luck at another studio. And I wasn't really sure, but it, it was approaching. And what helped me make the decision to, to commit and leave was we found out that we we're expecting our first child. And that really just like got the gears turning. I oh, it does. Oh it? yeah, big time. <laughs> I mean, I think I think being I was time poor and you know financially comfortable, but it was time poor. And so I just thought about, hey, what if scenario where I switched my visa to a talent visa, which would allow me to go freelance? And you know, I got thankfully I've got a, a good support network of other designers in in LA that kind of you know, held my hand and walked me through the, the what if scenario. And I, I, I thought it made the most sense to me because I was able to control the finances and I was also to control my time. And my, my partner and I were, we're out here by ourselves, both from Australia and she's got a really, really great job that she's, she's doing tremendously well in. And it wasn't really something that she was, you know, look, she was pretty committed on going back to work, I should say. So it made sense for one of us at least to have a flexible schedule. And so that's what got us into the, the, the idea of, yeah, let's, let's try something else. And so I went through the process of getting a visa, which is not an easy process and was approved thankfully. And, and once the previous visa expired, I, I resigned and said hello to a new, new world. You, you really just described the first half of my freelancing book I wrote, which is like why why you want to freelance absolutely because you, you you use the word time poor yep. and and you also brought up something that i feel pretty strongly about that just the the general work yourself silly culture yeah. in in this country sucks mm -hmm. um the idea of two weeks of vacation being okay sucks mm -hmm. um yeah and you obviously had a you know a, a, a lot to say about that, you know, coming from a country where that is just not the norm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so that's really interesting. And, and so how long were you freelance? Uh, I was, well, gosh, I left 
July, it's funny because July 4th was actually the first working day after I left. So that's kind of like my own independence day now that I get to celebrate. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> so I, I was officially out July 4th and then uh, Steve and I started the company uh, basically March 1st of this year. So uh, what is that, like nine months basically? So it was, it was a short run, but uh, it was long enough for me to, to know that freelancing wasn't something that was going to be long term. Interesting. Now, why why did you come to that decision? Uh, I think I think for more like selfish reasons. I think when I when I started freelancing with other companies, I had a, I yeah, first and foremost, I had a, a really good time with the people that I worked with. I worked with um, Laundry, who are a great studio in LA. Oh yeah, uh, Jake Sargent, who's a phenomenal designer, and then uh, Mad Microbe, which is Joel um, Jolatron's studio, Joel Dublin. We. I, ju- I just felt that um, I was still working under someone else's banner. And I think that that really sort of helped me shift my, th- my perspective. And especially when I was, t- I was talking to other studios about coming in and this whole idea that like, oh, you can design and animate. Oh, and you also do like technical direction. Oh, and you can build a pipeline and build tools. Like I almost felt like, oh, I'm giving up quite a lot to the studio for a day rate. You know, it, it wasn't like... I was talking about profit sharing or anything like that with projects. It was just strictly come in for a day rate. And I just kind of felt like maybe, maybe I should do this by myself. And, and Steve and I had talked loosely about setting up our own studio for quite some time. I mean, we, we certainly had intention behind some of the projects that we'd done specifically pause fest is like, what if we were just working on our own outside of the studio? What, what would it look like? So we had a little bit of work um, behind us to kind of encourage us that it would be possible. And so I think after a couple of months, um, Leo, my son, came along and Steve was also feeling the, the, the urge to kind of move on from capacity as well. And so we thought, yeah, let's do it. feels right. That's really cool. So what's the difference then between – so, you know, you, there's, there's the two of you mm-hmm. and it's called Ranger and Fox. What's the difference between what you're doing – and and what it would be if it was just you know Brett and Stephen freelance buddies who share an office. Well, I think it's it's two things. It's it's creating a brand. It's it's creating something that someone can come and purchase a product from, and it also gives us an umbrella to build something bigger than us. So with those in mind, I think for the time being, and especially you know what the 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 run that we've had since the beginning of the year. It has just been us. But we've started to build, you know, a little bit of a wider net or a right, wider perimeter of people that we have in this in this entity now, you know, as far as business manager, legal, IT, a, a pool of freelancers. And I think as we start to build more brand awareness and put more work out that generates more work for us, Hopefully there's a tipping point where we can start saying, hey, you know what? We can actually hire another, say, creative director or another director to spearhead this particular project that we can work with. Or we can start bringing in a junior and, and trying to you know, grow them into a director. I think, I think it just gives us opportunity to, to take on many different paths that we might want to take. That makes a lot of sense. So essentially... You're setting up Ranger and Fox as the brand, you know, b- behind the two of you, knowing that if it goes well, that's going to enable you to kind of like bring other people into the fold and actually build a true, you know, quote, studio. And, you know, I listened to your um, your interview with Ash Thorpe, uh, and we, we should link to that in the show notes sure. too. Um, it's a really good episode. Um, and you guys mentioned that you kind of made a conscious decision to start really small. And it's just the two of you, and I'm assuming, you, do you guys have an office? Like, tell me about the overhead of Ranger and Fox. <laughs> yeah, the, the overhead is minimal. Uh, we, we spent the first four months working out of my spare bedroom, which was probably like 400 square feet, maybe maybe less, actually. It was, it was pretty tough. Cozy. Very cozy. Uh, yeah, in the middle of summer in Southern California, it was uh, not nice. But, you know, we, we moved on to a, a big boy studio, and we have a, a pretty pretty nice loft uh, in the arts district downtown and it's like a exposed brick polished concrete exposed uh, rafters it's it's a really like cool uh, loft to work out of and we're going through a bit of a facelift where we're, we're getting some sort of actual interior design in there 
Um, so we can actually bring clients over and, and actually have like a, a place that people want to come to, not just right. the place that we chucked a couple of computers. So um, we've, we've, you know, when we first started the company and I think um, to that point that we were making in the other podcast was we had all these grand ideas of like, oh man, it's going to be great if we scale and oh, we need an executive producer, we need a, a line producer, we need this, this, this and this and how cool is it going to be when we do this and this? You know, like we were, we were just, you know, intoxicated with the idea of, of growing this huge thing. And I think when we sort of started to look at it objectively and then start to sort of analyze other studios and think about sales and, and how the sales pipeline would affect you know, X and Y in that process, we started to think, well, you know what? We are super small. We can operate on a really, really low overhead operating costs uh, sort of platform. Let's, let's just see this through as small as we can be for as long as we can be until we actually need to grow. And that's what basically what we've been doing this year. We've been thankful that we've, we've had enough work come in that it's kept us busy. And we've definitely hit our bandwidth with a couple of overlapping projects where we, we felt the need that, oh, hey, it'd be good if we had a producer that could offload this from us or maybe we had a, a third designer or, or an editor or someone, you know, just to kind of help with that pressure. So I think this year is all about tripping over and just getting back up and, and understanding what it's going to take to run when we're ready for it. So between the two of you, who's going out and doing sales, who's producing, like, what does it look like when you guys have overlapping jobs and you're both in the trenches designing and animating? Yeah, good question. We, we've actually, we're trying different, uh, scenarios. So both of us take an active part in sales and it's something that we're just dipping our toes in, uh, frequently enough that there's momentum, but it's not something that we're like dedicating a lot of time to, you know, uh, the work has come first up until this point. And uh, that's something that we're, we're looking at like a long-term play, you know, just planting seeds, getting that dialogue going, thinking about marketing and, and how we can sort of uh, present ourselves outward facing as, as we're getting those dialogues off the ground. And uh, the producing side of stuff at capacity, we were, um, I guess in a position where we had to play part of a producer in the way that studio is set up. So the producing roles weren't foreign to us. And when we, when we get, got things off the ground, there was a period of time where I was doing a lot of the producing side of stuff and, you know, we got all of our spreadsheets in order. We got all our contracts in order and, you know, the, the dialogue with the client was all, all handled on my side. And that allowed Steve to really focus on, you know, what he was handling at the time. And just recently we just kind of switched roles because there was a lot of stuff that I was learning as I was going on, a lot of nuanced stuff that hadn't really had to process before. And we realized that like, Hey, it's in both of our benefits for both of us to be equally skilled and experienced in these types of roles. And, um, I think at the moment we're just trying to take on as much as we can possibly take on until we absolutely cannot take on anymore. And at that point, that's when we'll, we'll start talking to a producer or an EP or something to like take over those jobs at, on a more of a full-time level. But like I said, with, without the overhead, we don't have to worry about the sales cycle as much as if we went down the path of scaling out and, and really building something big quickly. I bet there's a lot of studio owners who envy <laughs> the, the flexibility that you have. And I think it's great too that you're able to do it because of your background, you know, of being a generalist and being able to design and animate and having the technical skills. Um, cause you know, not, not everybody would be able to essentially run a full studio <laughs> with two people. It's really, it's, it's amazing what you guys have done. Did you, uh, what was the reason you guys stayed in LA? Was it just, we live here, we like it, our friends are here, or was it, was there any business decision going on there? I, oh yeah, it's a bit of everything. We, so obviously I'm from Sydney, so that's my home. That's where my friends and family are. My Julia, my partner is from Sydney as well. We just have a child, had a child. There was definitely a natural urge to move home, but because of how expensive Sydney is and how much we love LA and how well Julia is doing in what, in her career, it wasn't an option that we wanted to consider. It just made sense to stay here in LA um, Steve is actually from Michigan and likewise his family, his support network is over there, but he's been in LA for so long that 
he's happy here. And uh, him and his wife are both from Michigan and they've, you know, created a really nice life for themselves here. And um, I think, I think, you know, we could have tried another city, but it just, it's just happenstance of where we are right now. So, you know, in a perfect world, I'd love to move to like somewhere in Texas and buy a giant ranch or Montana or something and just have a huge, huge lot of land like Michael Jones bought up in Portland and just b- right. build a beautiful house and, and work from there remotely. And, you know, I don't think clients are going to worry too much about where you are, but Hey, we're in LA. So let's just, let's just, uh, set up shop and see what happens. And coincidentally, we haven't really worked with any clients in LA since we've been here. So I think it's probably less important than it had been in the past. I think that, um, prestige of having LA or New York or London in your, uh, address is probably, probably somewhat important still, but not as much as, as it was. Yeah. Well, I remember I, you know, I kind of came up in the industry in Boston mm. and the, the, for, uh, for a while, the big thing to do was to grow your shop in Boston and then open like some tiny, you know, basically rent a, get a PO box in LA and have your West coast office <laughs> Yeah, so, <laughs> just for the, yeah, just for the cachet. Yeah, of it. Sure. Uh, that's, that's really funny. And I'm guessing, you know, I was going to ask you about your clients, but it, I mean, it seems like getting clients now is a lot less dependent on where you, where you live, where your office is. Um, but how about freelance talent? I would have to imagine that, you know, if you're thinking of growing, um, it sounds like you are that talent is going to be a consideration. I would imagine LA has got to be a lot easier to find talent, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's something that I don't know what it, what it will eventually look like. I think the type of freelancers that I would bring in for projects are international. I mean, uh, good friends of mine, like, uh, Twisted Polly, Nate, who you've, you've talked oh, to yeah. before. Nate's, yeah. Uh, you know, him and I have been friends for forever. And now that I've set the company up, I'm like, yeah, dude, like when, when there is the right project or right internal project, you're coming on board and we're, we're going to make something great. And so I think those sorts of collaborations, are what we're going to look forward to. I mean, um, Simon Fiedler in, in Germany is just a t- tremendous Houdini artist that I'd love to bring him on board for something. And, you know, there, there are certainly amazing talent in LA and I think it's all yet to be seen. I think, uh, I think there's, we've got a small roster of people that we, we trust, uh, that we've worked with in the past that, that certainly can knock it out of the park with, with whatever you send them. And I, I think it's just something that we're just going to you know, figure out as we go along. But being in LA certainly gives you a lot of like boots on the ground talent to, to work with. Well, this has been, this has been amazing, man. I think the last thing I want to ask you about is where this is all going. Cause you've, you've got an amazing, you're in an amazing position now because you've got low overhead, two very talented founders already getting a great work. I, you know, the, I, I went to your site and I saw something you just did, I guess, for Microsoft, mm-hmm. um, you know, and it, and it's, I mean, it's like, it's super high end design animations. Great for a huge client. I mean, you're doing stuff like that right off the bat. You probably don't have much to worry about where, like, you know, where do you want Ranger and Fox to be? Do you want to try and stay small for as long as possible? Or one day do you want to, you know, do you have images in your head of looking out over a sea of 20 people (laughs) all working for Ranger and Fox? I think the former, I think, I think we'll keep it small and, and tight and, and really, grow the potential of, of capabilities and directing output that we can, we can create for our clients. I think one thing that we're really interested in exploring is the counterbalance of client work. And so, you know, one benefit that we have is if we have a client and we're doing work that we're able to show and happy to show and and proud to show, and they're also paying the bills, well, Let's fill the downtime with something as creative as some of the pause fest or the confidential awards stuff that we've done in the past, uh, Steve and I have done, that we can start to really grow and explore what we're fully capable of doing. And hopefully those passion projects and internal pieces have enough intention and focus that um, we can go after newer clients in a different sector and, and start to start to just kind of grow a family of clients. And for us, I think um, the relationship is most important and most valuable. So we might only have a client roster of, you know, three or four companies, but that's, that's all we're looking for to, to maintain the,
the um, the the sort of level of work and level of output that that we're we're striving for at this stage. And hey, if if we uh, are lucky enough to to get too much work, um, then that's when we'll we'll figure out the scaling thing. And maybe one day we'll inevitably look out to twenty artists. But um, I think it's it's going to be an interesting journey, and um, it's it's something that Steve and I are really proud of of what we've seen so far, and, and we're definitely really excited about what's ahead of us. Check out Ranger and Fox at rangerandfox.tv and check out the show notes on our site for links to everything we talked about today. I want to thank Brett for coming on and being so generous with his time. And I want to thank you, yes, you for listening in. Until next time.